Welcome to Bootloading 101. My name is Trey German and I'm a C2000 Applications Engineer. In this video, we'll cover everything from what a bootloader is to how they work and some of the advanced functionality that can be added in more professional implementations. We'll start off this presentation by discussing what a bootloader is and how they're used. Next, we'll touch on where bootloaders are, both from an application perspective and from a memory perspective. We'll continue by diving into the internals of the bootloader to really understand the pieces that make it work. Then, we'll walk through a typical bootloader execution flow from Reset. Finally, we'll cover some of the gotchas that trip up less experienced bootloader authors, as well as some of the advanced functionality that you may see in a more professional uh, bootloader. We'll finish by talking about some of the C2000 specific solutions that are available. Let's get started by discussing what a bootloader really is. A bootloader is any piece of code that loads or executes the main application. This encompasses everything from big PC bootloaders such as Grub to the small RAM loaders found in the ROM of uh, F2802X Piccolo devices. In most embedded cases, a bootloader is a small piece of code that resides somewhere in Flash. This code is run before the main application and has the ability to erase and program Flash as well as receive a new application via some communications peripheral. This enables the firmware of an embedded device to easily be upgraded by the end customer in the field with no knowledge of the underlying hardware and software. Now that we know what a bootloader is, where do we find one? Bootloaders are ubiquitous. and The reason for that is because they reduce maintenance costs of end products. Think about it. If a manufacturer has to have end products returned to them in order to fix a firmware bug via JTAG, millions of dollars would be wasted not only in shipping, but in the manpower needed to reprogram each unit. With a bootloader, the responsibility of a firmware upgrade can be shifted to the end customer reducing costs on the business and improving the end product quality over time. In a more literal and geeky sense, bootloaders typically reside in a single flash sector or in ROM. On Piccolo devices, a series of small loaders reside in ROM and can be used to load and execute code from RAM. While on the surface this may not seem very useful, a user could load the flash programming libraries into RAM using one of these loaders, and then program their application into Flash. But this specific use case is beyond the scope of this presentation. Instead, we'll focus more on the case of a Flash bootloader, because these are the most often used bootloaders for field firmware updates. So you may ask yourself, why does a Flash bootloader need to be separate from the main application? Well, there are a couple different restrictions on the bootloader use case which cause this restriction. First, the bootloader must never be erased. If the bootloader were to be erased, the application could no longer be upgraded in the field. Second, Flash may only be erased a sector at a time, while it can be programmed a word at a time. Erasing a Flash sector causes every bit to be set to a 1 and programming operations selectively set bits to zero. Given these two restrictions, it becomes clear that the bootloader needs to reside in a different sector from the main application in order to ensure it is never erased and firmware upgrades can be executed in the future. If the bootloader doesn't fill an entire sector, some flash space may be wasted, but this space could potentially be filled with code that's shared between the bootloader and the application or known constants that won't change. We'll touch more on this later. Well, now that we know where to find a bootloader, how does it work internally? From a top-level perspective, a complete bootloader system consists of three pieces. Some type of host, which in the future I actually see becoming uh, more mobile devices uh, instead of PCs or laptops. Uh, an embedded target whose firmware is to be upgraded, and then some type of communications link. Bootloaders exist that get their firmware with everything from the most humble UART 
to an outrageously complex uh, interplanetary RF link in the case of you know, rovers and, and satellites on Mars. If we dig a little deeper into the embedded side of things, we'll see that the distribution of the bootloader in memory is very important. The first thing I want to call out is that most flash programming libraries, even those outside of C2000 and TI, need to be run from RAM. This means that the linker command file for your bootloader should load the code into Flash, but link it to run from RAM. Then, before any of these functions are called, they should be copied from Flash to RAM. There are many examples of this in the USB Flash bootloader for the F2806X device. The second important piece in terms of memory layout is that the bootloader should reside in the same sector as the Flash entry point. This ensures that the bootloader always executes at boot time as long as this sector is never erased. If it were placed in a different sector and the flash entry point sector was used for application code, then if the power were lost while this sector was erased, the device would not boot back into the bootloader and the end product would be bricked. If we look even deeper into the internals of the software, we'll find a few different key pieces. One of the most important parts of the bootloader is the communications link. Typically this consists of a hardware communications peripheral, a software driver, and some type of kernel that handles communication with the host. Typically a simple protocol with read, erase, write, and reset commands is used, but additional commands and functionality can easily be included. The protocol engine, or kernel, uh, interprets these commands and then takes the appropriate actions using the resources available to it, which typically consists of a buffer and some flash programming algorithms. When, our, when an erase command is received, the kernel will call the flash algorithms and erase the requested sector of flash. As data is received, the kernel places that data into the buffer, and when enough data has been received, a call is made to the programming algorithm with the buffer passed in as a pointer. Now that we know what's inside the bootloader, let's take a look at the typical execution flow from reset. When the device is reset, the first thing it should execute is the bootloader. In some cases, the user may want to force an update, so it's a good idea to have the bootloader check a GPIO uh, to allow the user in the field to force an update. Next, if an update has not been forced, the bootloader will typically check the validity of the application. This is done by checking the application entry point and a checksum or CRC of the application code. Finally, if the checks pass, the application is branched to and executed. However, if any of those fails or an update is forced, the bootloader will start its firmware update mechanism, uh, which we took a look at earlier. One thing to note, Sometimes an application may want to invoke a firmware update itself, so some bootloaders actually provide a way for the main application to branch back to the bootloader to perform an app firmware upgrade. Once a bootloader enters the firmware update mode, so to speak, a few initialization tasks must be taken care of. Any code linked to run from RAM must be copied, and the communications link must be initialized. Next. A command is typically sent from the host to erase the flash, followed by data for programming. Most devices have more flash than RAM, so the main application must be loaded a small piece at a time, and then programmed into flash. This continues until the host has programmed the entire application. Finally, the host will send a command to reset the device, which hopefully will ultimately result in the newly programmed application executing, if everything went according to plan. Bootloaders are extremely low-level pieces of software, and as such, they have restrictions and caveats about how they can be written and used. Let's take a look at some of the typical hang-ups you might run into writing your first bootloader. The first problem that almost every bootloader has is that it typically doesn't fill the entire flash sector, so oftentimes flash space is wasted. In most applications, this isn't an issue, but when code space becomes limited, you may need to use this extra space in the bootloader sector. Constant tables or driver code could easily fill this space and be used by both the application and the bootloader if needed. 
The second issue often faced is alignment. Some flash algorithms like the programming buffer to be aligned to a certain offset in order to program correctly. Read the documentation for the flash algorithm you're using, and if you need to align anything, look for a compiler pragma in the compiler's user guide. The third gotcha is pretty basic, but I feel it needs to be called out again. Uh, flash algorithms typically need to be run from RAM. There's a few exceptions to this, but all C2000 flash programming algorithms must be. Don't forget to link them properly and copy them to RAM before executing. Finally, don't forget about code security. If you intend to use code security, you'll need to read the documentation for the security module carefully to make sure your bootloader is linked correctly and that it has the ability to unlock the device before flashing. A bootloader can be as simple or as complex as the author wants it to be. In this section, we'll take a look at some of the advanced functionality a bootloader author may want to add in a professional bootloader. One of the problems we discussed earlier was that in a simple bootloader, the unused space in the bootloader sector goes wasted. We can of course fill up this space with constants, tables, or other unchanging software, but what if we wanted to use the space for the main application code that's going to be changing during the firmware update? We would have to erase the bootloader in order to erase the application spaces uh, part of that sector. This is actually possible if you copy the bootloader to another sector before erasing the first copy. Then the bootloader is copied back to the original sector, leaving the application space part of that sector erased and ready for programming. This is an extremely complicated function to implement, so I won't dwell on it in this video. But for an example of how this might be implemented, look at the failsafe mode of the F2806X USB flash bootloader. Encryption is another advanced function which is typically found in more professional bootloaders. Protocol analysis tools are extremely cheap today, which makes it easy for attackers to spy on a communications link and extract the firmware. Encrypting the communication from the host to the embedded device will substantially improve protection from attackers. Finally, the application validity check can range from something as simple as a checksum to an extremely complex hashing algorithm. A nice middle-of-the-road approach is to use a CRC. This will guarantee with great accuracy the validity of the application. Some devices, like the F2806 series, even have accelerators that can yield substantially faster CRC calculation times. This can be useful in applications that have a startup time requirement. The C2000 team provides several bootloader solutions. Let's take a look at what's available. We briefly touched on the RAM loaders earlier, but I want to spend some more time discussing them. Every C2000 device has a ROM that executes before the user application code. The ROM contains bootloaders for most of the communications peripherals present on each device. These loaders may be used to boot a blank chip, load code into it, and then execute that code. These could be used as a field flash programming solution, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Recently, I worked on the UniFlash tool to add serial flash programming support for the Concerto devices. This was implemented using the serial RAM loader uh, to load and execute a kernel that I wrote into RAM. Once the kernel was running, the kernel was used to download various flash programming and erase algorithms, as well as the user application code. This allows us to program a completely blank chip, or programmed one for that matter, uh, with nothing more than a serial cable and a PC. The same idea could be applied to another uh, RAM bootloader to implement a similar flash programming solution. We currently supply one complete flash bootloader free of charge in Control Suite. This is the USB bootloader I've discussed throughout the presentation, and is available for the F2806X series of devices. Uh, this bootloader may be a good reference or starting point for someone writing their own bootloader uh, with a different device or communications peripheral. While this next one isn't a complete solution, it is useful all the same. C2000 devices contain a one-time programmable or OTP uh, memory area that's usable by the customer. 
A small enough bootloader could be programmed here and then the boot to OTP boot mode used to execute it at boot time. In most applications, the bootloader is never updated, so this works out well. However, if you do intend to update your bootloader in the future, do not place it in OTP. Finally, C2000 works with several third-party design partners to provide more customized bootloader solutions. Sima Software is an expert in all things CAN and has worked with C2000 and our customers numerous times in the past. They have bootloaders already available for nearly every C2000 device. Their solutions are lean, efficient, and competitively priced. CodeSkin is another excellent partner with C2000. They provide free flash programming tools such as C2 Prog and also uh, offer off-the-shelf and customized bootloader solutions. CodeSkin solutions are also very efficient and competitively priced. If you don't have the expertise to write a bootloader from scratch or you need a quick turnaround, I would highly recommend uh, that you see what each of these companies has to offer. Well, that about wraps it up for Bootloading 101. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe even learned something. Till next time.